Good afternoon and um, welcome to the Panizzi Gallery for uh, the curator's talk about the, um, uh, the exhibition we have on, Recollections of Exploration and Voyage. Um, before we begin the proceedings, uh, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wadi Wadi people of Darawal country. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Wollongong is built. As we share our knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Okay, um, uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to talk today about the, um, the material we have in the exhibition, um, which is part of the Bakarovich collection. Um, just to give you a brief overview of that, um, Barry, who is, who is here uh, this afternoon, is an alumnus of the university and has been um, uh, making a, a number of donations uh, of rare material, books, art, um, photographs, albums um, over the last 10 years or so. Um, I think Barry's first donation to the university was um, the copy of Cook's Voyages, which we have on exhibition here. And, um, you know, it's an extensive collection. I think there's over 280 individual items um, in, in the collection now. And um, it's great to be able to um, have these in our collection and to be able to um, uh, reveal them in exhibitions such as this and through our, our online digitisation processes and, uh, and to make them available for people to, um, to, to see and, um, and understand. Um, a lot of the material in the collection, such as Cook's Voyages and the Flinders items, um, uh, aren't available in regional collections and um, you know, it's quite, quite remarkable that we have them here in Wollongong and, uh, and are able to, um, to get them out. I'm, I'm going to do a mixture of, of I've, I've got some notes and, um, and a, the talks that I, I have planned. I've got some slides too, and um, I'm sort of going to switch between both of them and, um, and hopefully just make some observations about the material that, that we have here and what that means um, in, in a number of different readings of, of, of the collections and what it means um, as part of our history and what it means as part of our present and, and as part of our, our future. How we remember things, how we perceive things and, and how we actually represent um, the reality of the world around us as we, as, we, as we move through it. And there's some interesting themes, you know, right well, through life and through the material that we have here, which, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll point out as, as we move along. Okay, well, Traveller's narratives the souvenirs of journeys and places both unknown and well-loved, whether they're informative tracks or entertaining yarns, they never cease to fire the imagination. Modern travel is a multi-billion dollar industry catering for all ages and interests. It's comfortable and aligned with leisure and relaxation in the modern psyche. It hasn't always been like this. So this series of exhibits from the Bakarovicek collection illustrates the evolution of the traveller and how their journeys and experiences were documented. Whether they were a royally funded expedition to the far side of the world, a colonial watercolourist looking for commissions or a jobbing photographer with a wagon load of equipment, whether they travelled across the world or across the city, the accounts of the traveller told through text, illustrations and photographs depict a view of the world that expanded rapidly through the discoveries of the 18th century mariners and contracted sharply through the tools of war. There are parallels with our modern experience. Disasters at sea, unexpected delays, strained relationships and unfamiliar sights. And these souvenirs tell us as much of the traveller as they do about the place explored. This illustration is from um, Cook's Voyages and <clears throat> it's a, a view of Botany Bay and it looks quite, um, quite idyllic really uh, when you think about it. And one of the things that, that you'll notice through the illustrations that I've selected for the, the presentation at least is that there is always well, not always, but quite often there is a, um, an Aboriginal person in, in the foreground of the image going about their, their traditional um, um, life. And, you know, I've always found that quite interesting in the way that, um, you know, the, the, the fantasticness of the strange southern continent was, was anchored in, um, in the vision of, um, you know, the English imagination uh, and even the European imagination and how that has, has changed as we, as we move along. So sea voyages were hazardous and expensive, and unless um, some return on the investment could be made, whether through territory gained, trading partnerships or technological and scientific advancements, the early explorers, the men filling in the blank spaces on the map, were the rock stars and celebrities of their time. Successful voyages guaranteed a place in society and history. And this is a map um, 
uh, that actually isn't in anything in the collection here, but it illustrates, you know, what was known about the uh, known about Australia uh, in 1787. It's based mostly on what Cook did, and um, you can see that they, you know, still didn't know that Bass Strait was there. Um, large parts of um, uh, of Western Australia are, are still unmapped and uncharted. But the um, but Cook had established a pretty good idea of what was what was in the South Pacific. You obviously got New Zealand, a lot of um, New Islands at the south there. So, you know. From, from the time of Cook to the time of Philip coming out in the first, uh, the first fleet, um, they had a much better idea of what they, were, what they were getting themselves into, but what they were getting themselves into was still, still a, a lot of unknown. So when Philip set off um, with the first fleet to settle convicts in the Antipodes, he also had an eye on recording his voyage for the edification of the audience of the time. Now, published accounts of voyages were a staple of the collective imagination at the time, and Cook's uh, Cook's published accounts of his voyages to the South Pacific and New Holland were extremely successful, spawning numerous editions and commentaries. Um, enterprising pub publishers lined up prospective First Fleet authors, Philip and Watkin Tench among them, much in the same way that the media will bid for the wedding photos of television personalities or the tell-all interview of, interviews of disgraced politicians. Their daring exploits were read with vigour and the income derived from the sales and subscriptions went some distance towards defraying the huge personal costs associated with such a voyage. There were about a thousand people on board the, the First Fleet and um, there were 20 uh, known accounts um, of the voyage that have survived from the people that were, that were there. Um, Arthur Phillips' account, not surprisingly, was a pre-eminent example. Um, Phillips' contribution is the commander of the First Fleet and the first colonial governor is well documented in this copy of the voyage of Governor Philip to Botany Bay that we have on exhibition here. It was first published in 1789 and it was advertised at the time as the official version of his experiences and it includes entries from Lieutenants Shortland, Watts, Ball and Captain Marshall. They each contributed to the success of the voyage and the First Fleet and the establishment of the British colonies in, in New South Wales. Now, a primary goal for Philip uh, when he came here was not only to establish the, the colony, but also to establish relations with the local people, uh, the, or, the Eora nation. And by his account in the book, um, it, despite being speared in the shoulder at one point, he, he believed it was successful. And uh, when Philip returned to England in 1792, um, his health was failing. He took with him Benelong and, uh, and another Aboriginal man, Yammer, Yammeranui. Um, and while Benelong and Yammeranui were in, uh, in London, um, they, they were fated. They were guests of William Waterhouse in Mayfair. Um, they were tutored in reading and writing and outfitted in the latest fashionable styles of the, of the city. Um, I was interested when researching this to find out that um, in the British Library there's a, a score of music which, um, which was based on a recital that the two men gave at a, um, at a function in Mayfair. And um, apparently, you know, it captured the, um, the, 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 the English people's imagination. You know, they'd never heard anything like that. And, um, and, um, and so a, a guy transcribed that and, uh, and people were... It was popularly published and people were, um, were trying to perform it themselves. Um, sadly, Yamaranui fell ill and died in 1794. He was only 19 years old and his remains were buried near Eltham. Um, Benelong uh, eventually returned to his home in 1795. And um, I was also, while researching this, I was, I was interested to learn that um, um, there are some letters that Benelong wrote back to England uh, after he came back, which have, um, were discovered in a German um, science journal of, of the period, which was quite quite unusual. But in, in the letters, there's a, a Radio National um, program on them, which you can have a look at on the ABC's website. But he talks about... Um, he, he sort of tried to do what, what Philip did when uh, Philip wrote letters back to um, back to the colonial secretary, saying things like, you know, I need this and I need that. And the transcripts of the letters that Benelong was writing to his friends in um, in England, people that he, he knew and liked, were, you know, if you could send me two pairs of shoes and a, and a pair of stockings. Because, you know, that was the example of, um, of, of what what letters were for, um, they, were, they were for requesting things. So um, moving right along, we've got, um, oh, I should have shown you that one. This is the, um, the, the front piece of the voyage uh, to Botany Bay. Um, got a picture of, um, of Arthur Philip there, and um, he looks, looks very tired. And it would have been tiring. 
So moving on to, to Flinders, um, and, and again, this is from um, the Voyage to Terra Australis, and you can see again, it's um, you know, a view of, um, view of Botany Bay, uh, and again, with Aboriginal people in, in the foreground um, sitting around doing, doing their business. Um, now, Flinders' personal account of his travels in and around Terra Australis was written while he languished in prison in Mauritius. Flinders successfully circumnavigated the, um, the Australian continent aboard the ship Investigator, um, which was a ship not without its problems, as he found out as he was um, moving through his um, circumnavigation. It was both leaky and rotten, and when he was off the coast of Western Australia, he had to abandon, abandon the ship's anchors um, in the hope of making it back to, back to Sydney. So Flinders, Flinders accomplished a great deal in mapping the coastline of the continent and a large part of his success was due to the assistance of the Aboriginal people he encountered and to the assistance of Bungaree, a Karingai man who acted as a translator diplomat during Flinders' circumnavigation. Um, when, once Flinders got back to Sydney, he set off for England aboard the Porpoise, um, a ship he was not in command of and... Um, no, perhaps not surprisingly, it was wrecked off the Queensland coast and they were in convoy with a couple of other vessels and they just kept going. So um, after a few days, Flinders and the surviving crew decided that they, they had to rescue themselves. So they had one of the ship's cutters. They sailed it back to Sydney and, uh, and put together a, uh, a rescue party which then went back to, um, it's called Wreck Reef. Um, it's just north of Moreton Bay. Um, and rescued the other guys, and then um, Flinders carried on his voyage um, back to back to England aboard the Cumberland, and he was in command of that vessel. Uh, but as luck would have it, um, the Cumberland wasn't in very good repair either, and Flinders had to um, go to Mauritius to uh, effect repairs. And it um, while he was there, he was arrested as being a spy uh, because the um, the French weren't very happy with English at, at that period of time. There was a war raging, and um, shortly before Flinders arrived, um, Nicolas Bourdin, uh, another French explorer who I'll talk about in a minute, had died in Mauritius, and um, Bourdin and Flinders had had an encounter, and. Um, the, this, the story goes that the governor of, of the Ile de France, as it was called back then, um, didn't want Flinders to go. So he imprisoned him as a spy uh, and various other charges as well at the time and, um, and kept him there for five, uh, five nearly six years. Um, today, the Lonely Planet Guide to Mauritius assures the weary tourists that it is an island of Eden, a palm-fringed paradise, that for Flinders it was anything but that. Now, like any modern traveller detained in transit, he occupied himself with his journals, killing time. It was a frustrating and excruciating wait, for not only was he jailed, he was missing out on the glory and promotion that the war was bringing to his peers. I'm not a mariner, but the modern, what, what modern traveller hasn't endured incarceration in airport transit lounges, delayed by weather or mechanical problems, harried by overzealous customs officials, exhausted, homesick and just wanting the ordeal to end? A contemporary traveller would perhaps Instagram their plight, Flinders did much the same thing, passing the time, writing up his journals and this account of his voyages and polishing his theory as to the naming of the country. He was eventually allowed to resume his voyage and finally made it back to London in 1810. However, the five years and seven months of imprisonment wrecked his career and his health and he died in 1814, shortly before his voyage. Uh, the, this edition of his, his voyages and discoveries was published. So moving on now to, um, to Baudin, and um, we know Baudin through the, um, the Perron volumes, the Voyage, uh, and I apologise for my French, Voyage de Découvre aux Terres Australes Historiques, uh, which was published in 1807. Now, Flinders obviously was not the only sailor pushing into the unknown. Nicolas Baudin, aboard the French vessel Le, Geo Le Geographe, was also mapping the southern coast of New Holland and undertaking other scientific inquiries. Now, Flinders and Baudin met at Encounter Bay in South Australia, and such was the nature of their meeting that Baudin effectively abandoned his mission to map the southern coast of Australia uh, as Flinders had beat him to it. Heading back to France in 1803, Baudin died at Mauritius, and the writing of the official account of their voyage and its findings fell to Perron, the ship's naturalists. Baudin and Perron had clashed throughout their voyage and the animosity was so, perverse that per so pervasive that Perron managed to describe the, an entire account of the voyage, three volumes in all, without once mentioning his captain's name. Perron himself died in 1810 and a further fourth volume um, was later um, completed by Louis de Fresnay uh, in 1811. 
And it was Freycinet's map of the Australian continent that was f the first published map of the landmass that we now recognise as, as Australia. And that comes out of, um, out of these books. This is um, it's not our, uh, our scan of it because it's all, ours is all folded up inside. The book is quite difficult to get at. But um, this is, uh, gives you an idea of, of where the French were at in terms of, terms of their, their exploration. Um, we know that um, they had different ideas about the, the naming of the, um, of the parts of the, the continent. Um, um, you know, the South Australia and Victoria were uh, ten Napoleon, and uh, and different other other parts um, are not fully described. So they, they spent a lot of time, you know, in, in this southern area, uh, and not so much along the, um, the the northwest. And you know, they they were they were looking to um, to conquer territory as much as much as the English were, uh, but sort of had the the well the the land grabbed out from underneath them um, at that time. And it's also interesting um, that when we when we think about these books in comparison to um, uh, the, the earlier work, so this was published in 1807, um, Phillips Voyages 1797. So it's got um, 30, 30 years, 30 years. Um, we, we're getting a different interpretation of, of, of what people are actually seeing. The, the European eye is beginning to acclimatise to, um, to the things that are, in fact, in Australia. So we see here we've got um, a, a kangaroo, which is um, one of the illustrations in, in Philip's Voyages, and then um, the, the Perron volume's uh, interpretation of, of a kangaroo. And we can see that it's sort of changing a little bit. They've still got quite, quite wimpy um, forearms. But... Um, but we're seeing them more, and um, you know, the Europeans are beginning to get their head around um, around the country. And so it was only a relatively short period of time, you know, forty years or so. Um, and the way we're seeing you know, Australia recorded is um, is changing significantly. Um, the depictions of the kangaroo are a good example of this. And um, you know, it's almost as if in the footsteps of discovery comes familiarity, and we begin to see a shift away from the science of discovery, replaced by a more commercial interest in souvenir. And this takes up oh, there's some platypuses. I, I included that because I really like those those platypi. Um, but that brings us on to you know souvenirs and exhibitions that um, that became popular in the mid 19th century in in Australia, and this uh, this is an example of uh, Frederick Terry's work. It's um, uh, Sydney 1853, a series of plates bound in an album printed from engravings. Now Terry, he, he was also known as Frederick Cassinus Terry, Frederick Clark Terry, Fleury. FCT, FC Fleury, FC Terry, Frederick Charles Terry. He was an accomplished watercolourist and engraver and was involved in a number of successful collaborations with the uh, relatively new then publishers Sands and Kenny. In the 1850s, keepsake albums comprising views and vistas of the colony were becoming popular gifts and also documented the beginning of a nationalistic pride in the progress and development of the colony. In this edition, Terry's name has been rendered as Fleury. I'm not entirely sure why his name changed so often, but um, he seemed to like being um, slightly European, although he, he was English. He came out with his brother in 1850 to look for gold, and that didn't work out for him, so um, he turned to, um, turned to painting, uh, which he was actually um, very good at. Terry's highly detailed images were held in high regard. He was one of the first colonial artists, along with Conrad Martins, to exhibit his work in Paris at the 1859 exhibition. And more recently, his images have assisted scholars in developing modern perspectives of the colonial development of Sydney, Newcastle and Maitland. Now, commercial publication was beginning to pick up pace and Sands and Kenny were to become a hugely successful publisher over the next century. And we have another item that, um, that they were responsible for. Um, the, the company still effectively exists today as John Sands, although they're a wholly owned subsidiary of the American Greetings Company. Um, but you can still go into a news agent and find John Sands... Um, products um, sitting in the card rack more often than not. Uh, the next item chronologically in the collection is Gerga Milleroy. Uh, this is by William Ridley with engravings by uh, W. Mason. Uh, it was published in 1856. And um, it was common practice uh, for 19th century Christian proselytizers to produce books of religious instruction in la the languages of, of local people. Um, these works were usually translations of Bible passages, and um, they, they've become, over time, uh, very important records of uh, increasingly extinct languages and cultures, um, especially in the once linguistically rich antipodes. 
Now, Ridley was a Presbyterian minister who came to New South Wales in the 1850s. He took on an itinerant ministry, it was described as, travelling through the New England and Darling Downs districts between 1853 and 1855, uh, where he, he studied and documented the Gamilaroi, Tipple and Turrbal languages. When he returned to Sydney, he wrote and published an account of his travels and several books on Aboriginal language. Now, this book is very interesting because it was intended for the use of the Gamilaroi people and primarily for the purposes of religious instruction. Um, and there, it, it's, it's um, been uh, produced in a way that was, um, was not meant to last. You know, they, they were meant to be used to, um, to help people and increasingly on missions and in camps in the, um, in the northwest of, of New South Wales and, and southeast of Queensland, you know, to, to get God. And, uh, and to become good Christians and all those kinds of things. And the, um, the books were, um, were you know, illustrated in a way which made it easy for people to um, uh, you know, translate phonetically or, or um, using, using images to, um, to get, get the messages across. And um, Mason's um, woodcut uh, engravings in this are, are particularly nice. And you know, I'll draw your attention again to the, um, to the kangaroo at the top, which is now um, becoming you know, quite distinctly different to the kangaroo that we saw in, um, in, in Philip's, Philip's voyages. So it's just one of those um, one of the interesting changes as we, as we become more familiar with what, what we have around us, our interpretations of these things change. And uh, this book is particularly important. And Ridley, um, Ridley did a, um, a quite an amazing job for a man of his time in terms of the, um, the documentation and study of, um, of the Aboriginal languages that he, that he did. So we, when we're talking about exhibitions, um, we move on now to the um, uh, Sydney International Exhibition of 1879. Um, we, we have a number of items from, from that exhibition, and the exhibition itself was, was fairly interesting. Um, I'm just going to draw your attention again to, even in 1879, when we're depicting um, you know, the wonder of, of Australia and Sydney, we've still um, got Aboriginal people in the, um, in the foreground cooking dinner, holding a spear, uh, and in this case we have a kangaroo too, which is, um, which is obviously getting ready for, to be cooked, but um, I hadn't noticed that until I started looking at these things more closely, the details that you, you miss. Um, we've also got the, the Southern Cross above us, and, um, and what is now the, um, um, the motto of, of New South Wales, uh, which is bright, uh, sort of roughly translate as, newly risen, how brightly you shine. Um, anyway, the, the Sydney International Exhibition was the first event of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere and it was intended to bring the world to Sydney at a time when the colony was prospering on a wave of gold and wool. 34 countries attended the exhibition and over 1.1 million people visited it. Sydney will not see another event of this scale and impact for another 121 years when the Sydney Olympic Games, came, oh, when the Sydney Olympic Games were held. Now... Um, Charles Bayliss uh, produced the photographs in the album we have on display and uh, he exhibited at the exhibition and was awarded a commendation for his photographs. Now, Bayliss remains mostly well known for his early panoramic views of Sydney and New South Wales and he documented, really documented the emergence of modern Australia in the second half of the 19th century. He began his photographic career as assistant to the itinerant Beaufoy Martin and the American and Australian Photographic Company. And they were um, contracted by Bernard Holtman, who we have pictured here, um, to undertake a series of photographs of New South Wales and Victoria for the purposes of marketing the colonies to immigrants. Now, um, Holtman was, uh, became a, a very wealthy man on the back of that nugget that, that we see here now. He, um, he was one of, one, one of a, you know, quite a few uh, people who came, looked for gold, and he actually found it. Um, one of the really interesting things about this, this image, which I have taken from the State Library of New South Wales Holterman collection, is that it's, um, it, it's a fake. Um, the, the photograph of the, of the ore that he found is, uh, is a separate photograph to the photograph of Holterman. The photograph of Holterman was taken many, many years after the, the nugget was actually discovered. And, um, and the nugget was, was crushed you know, almost immediately after it had been dug out of the ground because it was worth thousands of, of, of pounds. So. Um, I think Holterman, you know, wanted to, um, or you know, was a bit nostalgic about his gold mining days, and um, and had um, had Bayless concoct this this image. So you know, early Photoshop, um, but just as um, just as persuasive as as a as, as one of these documents of histories that you know may or may not be a little bit um, unreliable. 
And we see that a lot in, in collections of material um, and even in the exhibitions that, um, that are put together of them. You know, we, we have to make assumptions about different things and not, not everything is as real as, as we think it is. <clears throat> So Bayless eventually settled in Sydney in the 1870s. He was working for Holtman and uh, while also maintaining a successful commercial practice. And um, the photographs uh, reproduced, um, his photographs are reproduced in many publications of the time. And uh, in, in many ways, uh, the work of Bayless and his, his peers at the time were replacing the work of Terry, you know, where Terry had the very realistic engravings. Um, photography was now the, now the way of recording those, those types of things. And um, uh, it's, it's an interesting transition that we're, that we're moving, moving through now as, as technology um, takes over. Now, the International Exhibition itself generated a large amount of documentation, including souvenir editions, such as the ones that we, we have here. And um, uh, it also had um, a, a number of uh, awards that were given to the, uh, the people who participated in the um, uh, in you know uh, presenting things at the exhibition in, in, in exhibiting and we have a, uh, a medallion here as part of part of the collection um, the interesting thing about oh there's another Bayless photo which I have there um, the interesting thing about the um, the medallions is that uh, well the, the interesting thing about the Sydney International Exhibition is that there was a race to get it on before the Melbourne International Exhibition was was held in in 1880 and um, as part of that um, the, the Sydney organisers cut a lot of corners and one of the corners that they cut was actually engraving the, the award medallions with the, the names and the awards that the people actually received. So many of the ones that have survived are blank um, and those that have been engraved have been done at the, um, the exhibitor's own, own expense. Um, and you can see there's a great variety in the kinds of, um, kinds of information that you can get off those. Just because they're blank doesn't mean that they weren't awarded to somebody, it just means that the person that it was awarded to never got around to having it engraved. I have seen pictures of some on the, inter you know, on, on the internet that have, you know, have literally been engraved with a knife or, or something which is quite, quite coarsely done. Um, but um, you know, it, it says a lot about, about Sydney and the way that um, you know, they, were, they were newly risen and, and shining brightly as much as they could and they didn't want um, Victoria to take the, um, take the credit for having the first international uh, exhibition um, in the Southern Hemisphere. Funnily enough, the, um, um, the information on the internet from Victoria about their international exhibition is that it was the first official international exhibition. So you know, there's, there's these turf wars that occur um, as we move along. Now, uh, the International exhibition was held at the um, Garden Palace in, in Sydney and um, it, it sadly burnt down in 1882, uh, only a few years after the exhibition had, had finished. And um, the, uh, the, the collection of material that were, was exhibited at the exhibition had already been moved and it's formed the basis of what is now the, the Powerhouse Museum. And, um, and I, was, I was quite taken by this very dramatic depiction of, um, of, of the fire um, and um, I, I hardly d doubt it was anything like that, but um, we don't have a photo to, to prove it. So moving on to, to photographs, um, we have what I think is one of the most significant items in the collection, and that's the, um, the Pringle album. Um, it's, um, uh, the Pringle album is, is extra an extraordinary item. Um, Henry, Arthur's, uh, Henry Arthur Pringle's album of photographs of the Illawarra Royal from the late 1880s to the early 1890s when, when he, was, um, he was living here. Now Pringle arrived in Wollongong in 1888. He was sent here to manage the interests of the Southern Coal Company. And um, by all accounts, Pringle was an ambitious engineer with a clear desire to innovate. He forged ahead with expensive plans for coal extraction and shipping, building a large jetty, very similar to the Austin Mayor jetty photograph that we have here at uh, Port Kembla. And um, he was something of an early adopter of technology and would use a camera to document his achievements. Now Pringle sent many of his photos back home and, um, uh, to, and, you know, to his mother. Um, he was uh, essentially documenting, her, you know, his, his experiences, telling her what it, what it was like to be here. And um, these are the backs of a number of the loose photographs that were included in the album. And you can see that they're, you know, for mother, for mother. In some cases, he, you know, puts an inscription of it Sunday at home um, and all those types of things, the Coromel uh, camp in 1890. And um, you know, it's reasonable to assume that um, that all of the photos were were sent home to his his mother, and um, and she preserved them in the album uh, in in this way. So as he settled, um, as Pringle settled here to life in Wollongong, he bred horses, he married a local girl, and enjoyed picnics on Ferry Creek. Um, I went to Ferry Creek uh, where we were putting the exhibition together, and took a photo from where I thought. Um, that photo over there that we um, that we have up um, up there is, and I, I was astonished by 
by how how similar everything is. Uh, when I um, stick a photo, that photo on top of the photo I took, um, it really hasn't changed very very much at all. There are a few more trees in the way, um, but it's um, a very very similar view. And you know, with the um, if you added uh, someone in a canoe in, in the middle of Ferry Creek, it would um, um, hard to tell that, that it's changed at all. This is one of the astonishing things about the Pringle album is that um, the, the nature of the place, while it's changed significantly, is still very recognisable. Um, we, we're fortunate here to have a, a very proud skyline of the escarpment behind us and providing that you can you know, get a glimpse of, um, of one or other of the prominent, prominent knolls, um, or mountains, um, you, you can work out where you are. And you know, this is much the same thing that, that Cook and, and later Flinders were, were doing when they were navigating the coast and, um, and looking, to, um, uh, looking to map it. So um, I, I just find this, this, this particularly fascinating that um, you know, through the Pringle album you can step back over 100 years and see, um, see the place for, for how it was and how it is. Interestingly, there's more trees on... Um, that's what's now Pucky's estate. Um, you, uh, there, are, there are more trees on Pucky's estate now, obviously, it's a, um, as part of the Botanic Gardens and, and is, uh, a lot of work has been done on regenerating the land there. But in, um, uh, in Pringle's time, it was, it was quite denuded because Pucky was still in the process of, um, of refining salt there as, as part of his, his salt work. So um, um, obviously the tea tree was used to filter out the, the water on, on there. So anyway, I, I am digressing. Um, so Pringle was here uh, until the early 1880s, 1880s, 1890s, um, and he, he moved on to Norseman and started mining gold and then went to um, uh, India and then Zimbabwe, again involved in gold mining, before returning back to England in 1904. Um, the album has passed down through successive generations of his family and judging by the handling marks on the binding and covers, it was consulted frequently. Now it's interesting to note that the various inscriptions um, identifying the photographs in the album itself have been made by a number of different hands, and um, that makes us assume that the um, um, you know the translation of what the photos are has occurred over a period of time and been done by different people. And in some cases, the inscriptions in the album are actually wrong, and um, there's you know errors in, in the way that names have been transcribed and of, of what things are. And that's particularly interesting because, you know, we, we have faulty memories and uh, even though we have a fault photograph of it, we don't necessarily know what it, what it is. And, you know, we've learned from, um, since we've made the, uh, the Prinkle album available through Archives Online, um, on, online uh, that, um, you know, some of these things are wrong and so we're able to, um, to update the, the information that we have. Righto, moving right along, we'll just um, we'll touch on street incidents, a series of 21 permanent photographs with descriptive, descriptive letterpress and photographs by John Thompson. Um, that's a photo of John Thompson there. He was a um, Scottish photographer who spent a uh, extensive period of time travelling through Southeast Asia and, and documenting it with, um, with the camera, um, both culture and customs. And this is quite a rare photograph of him. For some reason, he stepped out in front of his camera while it was um, working on an exposure. And um, that comes from the, the Welcome Library collection. Now, um, he returned, when, when Thompson returned to, to Britain, um, he would, as T.S. Eliot would later um, suggest, he, he knew it for the first time and he wasn't entirely happy with what he saw. He became involved with a, a socialist journalist, um, who, uh, Adolf Smith, uh, and they worked on a, a magazine called Streets of London. Um, Adolf Smith would write stories about what was happening in, in the poorer parts of London and, um, and Thompson documented them with, um, with photographs. He was um, uh, essentially the first street photographer um, working, in, um, uh, working, working with a camera. And um, the, the view that they gave you know, the, uh, the wealthy um, ruling classes in England at that time of the, the poverty in the East End was, um, was quite shocking and um, it led to significant changes in, um, in the concept of social welfare, in how um, people thought that you should behave um, to children, in employing them. You know, this is the time of Charles Dickens' um, um, Oliver Twist, you know, where kids were working in in workhouses and being sent up chimneys to, um, to clean the soot out of them. And um, it was not, um, not something that um, 
the, the upper class that the, and the middle class in, in England felt particularly comfortable with, and they were being confronted with it through these through these photographs. There was a reality to it that they they didn't particularly like. So you know, efforts were made to to improve social conditions, and that's been something that's been rolling on e ever since. Um, so you know, photography at this time was still new and fascinating, and uh, and Thompson was roaming the world. Uh, and taking portraits of, of urban squalor in London, and they were unlike anything anything that anyone had ever seen before. They, they were not, you know, they're, they're posed photographs um, as these ones are, but they're not posed in the way of somebody standing there, you know, looking looking serious. They're posed in the way of someone, you know, enduring hardship and um, doing, you know, deeds. Um, ironically. Uh, Thompson later became the royal photographer and, and set up a studio in Mayfair and, and spent the rest of his, his career taking photos of the landed gentry. Um, which, um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that maybe he thought, well, his, his work had, done, had, had been done, he'd, he'd made, a, uh, made a blow for humanity. Um, but you know, the, it, I guess you take what opportunities are presented to you in, in life and, and certainly um, being the royal photographer was a, a big step up from, um, from where he was before. One of the other very interesting items in the collection is, is this one, this tourist guide to the beautiful Illawarra. Uh, we have a full um, uh, digitised version of it there on one of the screens and you can, you can see this one on, online. And um, you know, tourism for the masses was, was, was on its way. Um, this, this particular publication dates from 1903. Um, it is the second one in a, in a series of these, um, these types of tourist guides that were um, put together and published by, by Sands. And um, you know, the, the blank areas on the map um, had really been um, relentlessly shaded in uh, through the and the age of exploration was pretty much over. The age of tourism <clears throat> had begun, and in this constant um, in this context, it was following closely behind the expansion of the railway uh, from Sydney down to down to Bomaderry. Um, there was a growing appetite for short journeys, um, getting out of the growing sprawl of, of Sydney and. Um, Sands, partnering with McDougall, um, began to publish these tourist guides to, to different areas and um, it um, aimed to both generate revenue for the publishers, um, they sold a lot of advertising in these magazines, um, these, these publications, um, and also to encourage tourist, tourists to explore the wonders of the Illawarra as far as the train line terminus at Bomaderry. Um, there was a, a, a wonderful map <coughs> Um, that um, that I really like, which um, shows um, a, a lot of detail about the Illawarra and how it um, uh, how people could expect to you know travel down the main train line and um, and get to the places which are advertised in in the journal. And um, as it happens, I was on a train last week, and you know I'm comparing that to the um, to the current map that um, that in, informs us as us of, of where we are, um, but not necessarily of, um, of how where we are is. Um, there's a, you know, the, the abstractness of, of the, the map that we now use to, to navigate the South Coast Line is, is entirely different to um, what the tourists of, of the, um, at the turn of the century were, were, were looking at and, and hoping to find. Um, there's also quite a few more train stations in the, in the southern end, like places like Maru and Jasper's Brush, uh, no longer serviced by train. You would have to go into Bomaderry. Um, but I dare say they may have been to service, um, you know, dairy or, um, or mail or those types of things. You know, they're not necessarily a train station in the way that we think of them, but as a spot where the train would stop and you could, you could load and, and put things on. So, you know, the, they're, they're the same place. Um, you know, more people live here, obviously, but the geography hasn't changed all that much. But the way, the way we interpret it has. Um, and, you know, that's, that's quite a, a common depiction of, um, of the structure of the way we move around our, our modern world, as opposed to this more sort of naturally um, um, anchored, anchored map. Um, I, I think I'd rather see that on, uh, on the trains than, than the other ones. The, the other interesting thing about this edition is that very few of them have survived. Um, they, they were published as, as ephemeral items. Essentially, they, they were relatively uh, inexpensive, and they were designed for people to take, come down on the train, um, have their, their tour, come back home, and, um, and you know, literally discard them. A, a few of them, obviously, were, were retained, and um, they weren't built to last. So uh, that this one is, is still with us is, um, is, is quite significant. 
So I am now, ah oh yes, the stereoscopic cards. This is sort of the last and uh, most contemporary item that we have in the, the exhibition. And um, the stereoscope um, enjoyed a, a period of great popularity um, on, on the back of photography. Um, the stereoscope um, techniques uh, were developed actually quite early on in, 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 with photography. And, um, and were a mainstream form of, um, of communicating and, and documenting things in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, they promised the viewer a, a realistic and closer experience of, of the world. And various enterprising companies would sell sets of images as souvenirs and as, um, as a form of documentary service during the First World War. Um, there was sort of quasi-journalistic documentation of battles and, and triumph. Um, and you know they, they used a lot of breathless prose of the time to um, you know excite um, the imagination into what people people could see. Um, it turns out that a lot of them were were in fact um, faked. The, um, there was a you know an enormous demand for these types of types of things, and um, they would stage shots uh, in and around London so that they could um, they could get them because they didn't. Uh, often have access to the front and, and what was going on. Um, no less evocative for that, you know, I think there's a, there's a role for, you know, for appreciating propaganda for, for what it is. Um, and propaganda has been around for a, a new time, a, a, a very long time. You know, the Bayo embroidery is, is, is a work of propaganda. Um, you know, it was, it was stitched by the winners, not, not the losers, and it, it tells the story that they, they want to be told. Um, so similarly, the stereoscopic photographs that were, um, you know, in, encouraging um, the, the populace in, in Australia and, and in England to, you know, support the war efforts were, were designed for that, for that very purpose. Um, but stereoscopic photographs um, were, were yet another photographic innovation that um, had as much to do with technological advancement as it did with creating new markets for photographic publishers to exploit. Um, you know, much in the same way that people were buying 3D televisions in the early 2000s, stereoscopic photographs, you know, were a technological marvel, but they were being, they soon were replaced by, by moving pictures. And, um, you know, it, it occurs to me when I, when I look at these because some of that, that photograph at the top is, is quite graphic There's, um, and you know I wonder um, personally I, I, I find those things challenging to look at but um, there's, there's always been a fascination um, for uh, the, the public viewing of descriptions of these types of types of battles, and, and it hasn't waned. You know, we um, in, in in modern times, you know, war correspondents hold a, a special cachet in journalistic circles, and um, many of us would remember the embedding of journalists during the first Gulf War, and they were they were feeding images of you know death and destruction all that, all over the place. And to take this a little bit further, in the last decade, we've seen technological advancements in small lightweight cameras that have had a big impact on the perspective we now have on combat and conflict. There's a large and growing collection of soldier cams on YouTube, and um, there, there are some of them here, um, where you can watch actual warfare, um, you know, people shooting at each other from the, the shoulder or the helmet of, uh, of, a, um, of a soldier. And, you know, it, obviously, you know, the, the market for stereoscopic photographs um, in the First World War has, has not gone away. We're, we're still there and we're, we're still interested in, in what, um, what happens. There's one, one video there on the, on the screenshot which had 39 million views. Um, and that's, um, that's just, just uncanny. Um, so, you know, there's this, there's this sense that I, I keep coming back to when, when we look at everything from Philip's voyages um, up to, up to the, the present, really, where, um, the vicarious experience is 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 a very large idea uh, underpinning um, a, a lot of the material that we find find in the exhibition here. Um, you know the perspectives witnessed in the various publications, photographs, and other items we have on display. You know are both familiar and and different. You know, the sense of place and understanding has shifted from the extraordinary to the familiar, and then somehow back to the extraordinary and the familiar again. Um, things are connected, yet our understanding of them changes through time. So there is a circular nature to voyage, just as Pringle, Philip. Flinders and some of the other travellers represented in this exhibition eventually returned to their homes and one might assume knew it for the first time, or at least saw it in an entirely different light, a light that may have been coloured with bitterness over lost opportunities or inspired to brightness in the service of others.
Our recollections of exploration surviving here in their original editions and unique splendour provide an opportunity to examine our own ideas of the world around us and how we travel through it. We still yearn to travel and explore new things, to innovate and leave our mark, whether our observations survive us in handsome bound volumes or are echoed on a hard drive in some unimaginable future. We hope that our, experience, we hope that our experiences will last and prove valuable to those who come after us. I hope that you have enjoyed this small glimpse into the Bekarovich collection. Thank you.